Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's program. May I ask that you please to turn off your uh, cell phones or Blackberries or all electronic devices. I'm Skip Rutherford, Dean of the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service, and we are pleased to partner with the Arkansas Women's History Institute in hosting tonight's event. Uh, for how many of you, this is your first time to visit the Clinton School? Great. We're glad to have you here. This is the uh, nation's first master's in public service degree. And our students uh, come from all over the state, the country, and the world. And they are getting ready in the next six weeks to head abroad. Uh, they'll be going to all six inhabited continents uh, doing international public service work. To introduce our guest tonight is my friend Joe Blotty, a resident of Batesville, Arkansas, America's best hometown. <laughs> a, cons a consulting historian, Joe has more than 20 years' experience in research, writing, production, and management of award-winning historical projects in museums, public broadcasting, and publishing. Among her many accomplishments, she led the successful expansion of the old Independence Regional Museum, another wonderful treasure. It was Joe's idea for our two organizations to join together in this program tonight, so please welcome Joe Blotty. Thank you, Skip. It is really a pleasure to work with uh, the Clinton School on this project. And before I introduce our speaker, I just want to do two things very briefly. The first is to thank our collaborators, um, to say what a pleasure it has been to work with Skip Rutherford and his colleagues at the Clinton School Patrick Kennedy, Nikolai DePipi, and uh, Ben Beaumont on this project. We really thank them. Um, they've been great. And also to thank the Arkansas Humanities Council. Uh, this program is supported in part by a grant from the Arkansas Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities, which we appreciate very much. And I want to take just a moment before I introduce our guest speaker to, just in case you don't know about the Arkansas uh, Women's History Institute, to tell you uh, just a tiny infomercial about us. Uh, the Women's History Institute is an all-volunteer organization. 2008 is our 25th year. And um, we are dedicated to researching and recognizing the activities of women in our state. Uh, we do this primarily by presenting public programs, such as this one, um, uh, administering a manuscripts competition endowed by the Pryor family, which places research about Arkansas women's history in the archive at uh, the University of Arkansas Little Rock, and special projects, occasional special projects, uh, including a traveling exhibit that is available through the Arkansas Humanities Council uh, Media Resource Center, and a bibliography on women's history, which is available on our website. We salute the many who have helped us create these resources, and we look forward to continuing that tradition. And if you are interested in being on our mailing list um, or in our activities in general, please there's a sign-up sheet in the back, and two of our members are back there, and you can um, uh, be part of that, that as well. Uh, tonight, as we gather to hear about Dr. McMillan's perspectives on Southern women's experiences, I want to recognize the members of our board who've helped a great deal uh, to bring this evening into being. We are a working board. Um, so uh, please join me in thanking Julianne Crawford, Martha Rimmer, George Ann Sisko, Kyla McDaniel, Ann Folk, Dr. Sarah Beth Estes, Laura Miller, Heather Zinbinden, Dr. Phyllis Hines, Dr. Sharice Jones, Ethel Simpson, and uh, Ellen Compton, all of whom have contributed to the arrangements for this evening's program.
and now <laughs> to the main event. Uh, we are very pleased uh, to bring Dr. Uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Sally McMillan, um, to all of you this evening. She is the department chair and the Babcock Professor of History at Davidson College in North Carolina. She earned a BA at Wesley, uh, an MLS at Pratt Institute, an MA in History at the University of North Carolina, and the PhD in History at Duke. Um, she researches, writes, and teaches in several areas of American social and political history. The Sunday School Movement, race relations, the Civil War, civic participation, women's and family history, and medical issues. She participates widely in historical issues, professional activities, including the Southern Historical Association and the Coordinating Council for Women in History. Uh, she is the recipient of numerous grants and awards, including a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship for College Teachers, a Pew Charitable Trust Summer Grant, and, and she's, this is not her first trip to Arkansas. She's also received an Arkansas History for Medicine Associates Research Award. She appears this evening in Little Rock as an Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lecturer. She is the author of Seneca Falls and the Origins of the Women's Rights Movement, which was just released uh, in the Oxford University Press's Pivotal Moments in American History series, and also of To Raise Up the South, the Sunday School in Black and White Churches, 1865 to 1915, among other publications. And this evening she will speak on the topic, Sunday Schools, Not Suffrage, Southern Women in the Post-Civil War South. Dr. Sally McMillan. Thank you, Joe, and thank you all for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I was here 22 years ago doing research, and that's all I did, but today I had the pleasure of touring the Clinton Library, and also Joe took me to see Central High School, which was so impressive. I've been teaching civil, civil rights for a long time, and it was so exciting to see the structure. So this has been a delightful, delightful visit so far. Okay, if I'm a bit sleep deprived, it's only because we've been watching a lot of basketball at Davidson. I don't know. <laughs> Please keep up with our team. We made the, we're gonna be in the NCAA. We won our uh, tournament last night, late, but <laughs> here I am. Okay, Sunday schools not suffrage, Southern women in the post-Civil War South. In 1885, Mrs. D.S. Watson of Andersonville, South Carolina, explained the joys of teaching Sunday school. Despite her rather convoluted language, she realized that here she could, quote, fill the young and tender minds with love for Jesus so that our sons may grow up God-fearing men and our daughters polished after the similitude of a palace. Thousands of Southern women like Watson were equally enthusiastic and devoted themselves to a lifetime of teaching. Miss Batty Shropshire of Rome, Georgia, taught Sunday school for more than 50 years. A Hartsville, South Carolina woman committed 65 years to the institution. Pupils often adored their Sunday school teachers, such as children in an AMEZ class who draped their room in mourning for 30 days after a beloved teacher suddenly died. Others recalled a teacher who had turned their lives around. In the Sunday school, female pupils could shine winning silver stars for memorizing the most Bible verses, or a gold cross for five years of perfect attendance. Southern mothers knew that children who attended Sunday school would be the better for it. A widow in Galveston, Texas was thrilled that Sunday school had pointed all her children unto the Lamb of God. In the post-Civil War South, Sunday schools promised to uplift everyone involved in them, teachers, pupils, and parents. It was after the Civil War when the Sunday School grew by leaps and bounds, so rapidly, in fact, that the period came to be called the Sunday School Movement. By the end of the 19th century, most Protestant churches could boast a substantial Sunday School department. Several classes suited to different ages, 
dozens of teachers, and hundreds of dutiful pupils. Protestant denominations elevated the Sunday School to a central position within the church, for they regarded it as essential to a Christian nation. Millions of children and a growing number of adults attended church and Sunday School each week. In the South, the Sunday School movement gained an enormous following and developed profound significance after the Civil War. I argue in my book, To Raise Up the South, that Sunday Schools were pivotal in efforts to uplift the South. The Civil War had created a destitute region. As a Virginia Baptist observed in 1865, never was there a time in the history of our country when Sunday Schools were more imperatively demanded. Southern evangelicals should never rest until we see all our children able to go to Sunday school. During the complicated, challenging years of Reconstruction and after, Southerners and Northerners sought to uplift the South by fostering righteous living, high moral standards, and strong faith. Unlike the problematic political and economic efforts undertaken in the war-torn South, the Sunday school achieved success. Within a couple decades after Appomattox, Sunday schools were found in black and white churches throughout the region. Here youngsters might learn to read and write, all memorized catechism and scripture and absorbed good manners. They relished the sense of community that Sunday schools provided. Most important of all, many children converted and joined a church. Here females serve, serving as teachers found a meaningful role in the church and a place to employ their maternal talents in a socially accepted enterprise. They were active participants in this undertaking. Their contributions were enormous. Baptist minister Lansing Burroughs deemed Sunday school teaching the most noble and grand occupation on earth, one perfectly suited to women whom God had endowed with patience, hope, and tenderness. What struck me as interesting to ponder today is to consider the Sunday school movement in the post-Civil War South with my recent research on the 19th century women's rights movement in the North. These two events overlapped in time and both attracted women, yet they were hardly mutually supportive. Until the 1890s, Southern women were virtually absent from the women's rights movement. Most Southern women shunned the 19th century struggle for equality until the end of the century. And let me just say an aside here, and that is that um, this is an issue that has interested me since 1978 when our family moved from California to Charlotte, North Carolina. And I knew I had come into a foreign land. I had been raised in California, went east to go to Wellesley, and um, then moved back to California. And I was absolutely astonished at how different the South was, and I didn't understand women Southern women, Southern men, so I went back to school to study them. Um, and so, <laughs> and I just kind of kept going. But um, I've always been interested in these differences, and I think in my recent book on the Seneca Falls Convention and the women's rights movement, what struck me as so interesting is the absence of Southern women from 1848 until the 1890s. They virtually were not involved. So this is what I'm doing, is sort of combining my research on, on Sunday schools with more recent research on the women's rights movement. But I have a deep interest in this, in this topic. In some respects, um, Southern women's avoidance doesn't make sense. They should have been eager to improve their lot. Southern women lived under the same legal, political, and social restrictions as Northern women, perhaps even more so. In 1865, no American woman could vote, hold public office, or serve on juries. Once married, few women could sign contracts or claim their own wages or possessions they brought into a marriage. They had no rights to their children in rare cases of divorce or separation. Men ruled home and family, and law, tradition, and scripture supported men's elevated status. Women were to occupy a separate sphere from men in the domestic arena where they could care for their husbands, family, and home. And during the Civil War, Southern women's strength and independence were well tested. They played a central role in that war. In fact, so dedicated were they that the famous suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton <clears throat> hoped that Northern devotion to the cause, or excuse me, Southern devotion to the cause would inspire Northern women to perform with equal dedication. In the absence of men, Southern women raised their children, planted and harvested crops, fled invading armies, spied, nursed soldiers, and sacrificed for the cause. Their strength was needed when the Civil War ended. 
women like Ella Gertrude Thomas, Clanton Thomas, Mary Boykin Chestnut, and thousands of others became principal breadwinners for their families. Thus, they should have been eager to expand their rights and opportunities. Historians are of two minds explaining how the Civil War affected Southern white women. Assessing black women who became free in 1865 is easier. Most were eager to reunite their families, establish their own homes, strengthen their communities, and ensure future livelihoods. White women offer more challenges. Some scholars argue that during the Civil War, Southern women became well aware of their strength and abilities. After the war, more women engaged in paid labor, such as teaching school, working in factories, and running small businesses. Others pursued benevolent causes, such as temperance and public education. According to this scenario, women moved beyond the home and into volunteer and wage work. But other scholars feel the war drained Southern women and made them more dependent on men, not less. Drew Gilpin Faust argues in Mothers of Invention that overwhelming wartime duties that women assumed were not necessarily welcome ones. These four years were demanding, exhausting, and sorrowful. Most women disliked the burden of carrying on alone. They yearned for men to return home to help support their families. During the final year of war, tens of thousands of desertions suggest that many men responded to family needs, seeing home as more important than a failing war. The nation, but especially the South, faced an unprecedented crisis at the end of the Civil War. Vast social, political, and economic problems emerged. Some 280,000 of its men died. Former Confederate states needed to re-enter the Union, though how to do so was unclear. Four million free blacks needed the skills, education, and resources to enjoy their freedom. Homes, communities, and farms lay in ruins. The region's most profitable cash crops were virtually worthless without a dependable labor supply. Physically and mentally maimed soldiers returned home dispirited about their future. Many Southern families had to depend on beneficent organizations, on the government, and on the strength of women to survive and rebuild black and white communities and institutions. It made sense that Sunday schools resonated with tens of thousands of black and white Southerners. The Southern, Southern Sunday School movement, though, had its initial impetus in the North. Hardly had the war ended when leaders in Northern denominations identified the South as a prime locale to spread their faith. In this destitute region, they envisioned endless possibilities where individuals could renew their faith and join a church. Northern denominations and missionary organizations sent agents and itinerant ministers to travel throughout the region to preach, distribute or sell tracts and Bibles, and organize Sunday schools. They identified this region as one of the most effective, pragmatic means to spread the faith. Unlike a church, Sunday schools demanded few resources. Volunteers supervised and taught there. They could exist in almost any locale and thus be organized with little fuss or expense. Most importantly, the sense was that impressionable youngsters brought into the fold would grow up to become generous, devoted church members and right-minded adults. Southerners initially welcomed these Yankee missionaries. As historian Gaines Foster argues, most white Southerners were far too realistic to let bitter memories of the war get in the way of rebuilding their society. Within a few years, Southern denominations joined that effort and competed vigorously to establish their own Sunday schools. But whatever their origin, locals were recruited to run Sunday schools. Initially, both men and women served in, as Sunday school teachers, but within a decade, black and white women made up the majority, the vast majority of teachers, and this was a natural role for them. Most were mothers and dutiful churchgoers. Ministers preferred female teachers since they saw them as more compliant and therefore easier to work with than male teachers. Probably true. Many had experience as public school teachers, which had become a suitable occupation for educated black and white women to pursue before marriage. A teacher shaped what went on in her Sunday classroom. Here was an opportunity to shine, to make the classroom her own, and to convey lessons as she saw fit. Engaging in this enterprise gave women a sense of self-worth. Those who loved music might emphasize music appreciation and hymn singing. A touch of the dramatic served them well. One temperance activist conveyed the horrors of alcohol to her pupils by stumbling around her classroom, mimicking an inebriated man. <laughs> I love that scene. 
Women transformed classrooms with holiday decorations. The beauty of a Sunday school room overwhelmed one awestruck observer. Women's never failing but delicate taste for decoration greeted our eyes, he enthused. For the 4th of July, teachers accompanied pupils on picnics and excursions to the beach, mountains, or countryside. They held Easter parades, and pupils dressed in costumes marched through town to celebrate the glories of Sunday school. Society extolled the feminine, loving approach of female teachers, traits that allegedly encouraged all children to rush to Sunday school. Female Sunday school teachers presumably could win the hearts of youngsters. To foster women's participation, church leaders engaged in flatter, flattery, glorifying Sunday school teaching as the grandest job on earth. A Methodist teacher, uh, excuse me, a Methodist minister declared Sunday school teachers standing a close second to ministers in the important work they performed. Each week, a skilled teacher with only 30 precious minutes instructed youngsters in the glories of the gospel and led them toward conversion and salvation. A teacher could be as important as a parent in the spiritual life of youngsters, especially those from godless homes. Ministers celebrated the job as an opportunity for women to make a lasting impression on their young charges. In the 1870s, Reverend Lansing Burroughs delivered a series of sermons on women's role in the church. He insisted that women should feel blessed, for that now they were able to serve in a dual capacity, as mothers and as Sunday school teachers. No other job approached the magnificence of Sunday school teaching with its many dignities and, award, and rewards. Nobility and grandeur defined women's influence in fostering youngsters' salvation. One man noted that women could no longer complain of boredom and do-nothingness now that Sunday school teaching offered them a meaningful option. A minister went so far as to assert that the future prosperity and success of the church depended on Sunday school teachers who were nurturing future church members and thus enriching their denomination. Finding enough teachers, however, was an ongoing challenge as Sunday schools expanded so rapidly. Thus, the checklist of desirable traits, pious, intelligent, creative, humble, modest in attire, and conservative in behavior demanded compromise. Showing up for class on time and knowing the Bible became more valuable attributes than worrying about teachers who engaged in nighttime frolics. Denominational affiliation could be overlooked in order to fill positions. Churches welcomed any good Christian rather than insisting on membership in the church. After all, any pious individual could teach the Bible. In rural areas with only a single church and Sunday school, children of various faiths flocked to that single class. Unlike public school teaching, where women resigned when they wed, Sunday school teachers might continue working when married and raising children. No hard and fast rules limited Sunday school hiring when needs were so enormous. Gender was also an issue in administering the Sunday school. Supervisors oversaw Sunday school activities, hired new instructors, and purchased books and supplies. In white churches, superintendents were invariably male. White women were deemed too delicate to run a Sunday school. They were not accustomed to taking charge, to giving orders, that doesn't sound right, to keeping budgets, or to hiring and overseeing personnel. As Sunday school advisor James Axtell insisted, the duties were far too onerous for a woman. The work would tax her strength. Men, on the other hand, could handle such demands. Yet on occasion, when no male supervisor could be found, a woman stepped in and invariably did well. A Mrs. Lilly of Leakesville, North Carolina, served as assistant supervisor of a Sunday school. All who observed her at work credited Lilly with the school's success, for, as observers noted, she's doing nearly all the work. White women rarely challenged the assumption that men, rather than women, should take charge. <clears throat> From childhood, Southern women grew up with the idea that men were best suited to demanding tasks. Annie Armstrong, secretary of the Baptist Women's Home Missionary Society, echoed this belief. She felt that it was sheer nonsense to think that women could perform masculine duties, insisting that our brethren are God-appointed leaders. Physical and mental limitations allegedly prevented women from taking on such work. Intriguing thoughts from Armstrong, who held a powerful supervisory position in the Southern Baptist Convention. And those who challenged the norm suffered the consequences. In one instance of female assertiveness, 
two Arkansas women tried to be seated as delegates to the 1885 Baptist State Convention. Horrified male delegates promptly removed them from the hall and had their names excised from the minutes. Quote, we all insist upon women teaching in our Sabbath schools and in higher branches of scholastic learning, but we rule her out if she desires to meddle with the affairs of church polity, one male delegate fumed. Black Sunday schools were different. Out of choice, they, like black churches, were segregated. They served many of the same needs in the black community as in the white one, but also became an institution where blacks could safely confront racial issues and instill race pride. Teaching children, children such lessons fostered a spiritual culture unique to African Americans. Lessons often focused on teaching middle class values and self-worth and instilling respectability. For, as one teacher noted, it is impossible to be a complete lady or gentleman without it. Here, women were often front and center in all aspects of Sunday school work. A significant majority of black female teachers served the Sunday school. But unlike white Sunday schools, a noticeable number of black women were appointed supervisors and were welcomed as delegates to Sunday school conventions. They served on and chaired committees, delivered stirring public addresses, and garnered praise for their inspiring messages. In part, their involvement reflected the fact that gender divisions were less of an issue in African American communities than in white ones. Also, more black women than black men were attending school and eagerly sought opportunities to use their education in order to uplift their race. Another role that black and white women assumed in the Sunday School movement was as authors of the material the denominational publishing houses produced. By the late 19th century, publishing firms became big businesses for most denominations, both in the North and in the South. Women's writings appeared in Sunday School newspapers, Black and white women penned poems, short stories, essays, and hymns. They wrote Sunday school books such as Our Kate or The Grateful Orphan and The Widow's Sewing Machine. By the turn of the century, a handful of women even assumed editorial posts, typically overseeing publications for younger pupils. These writings, however, were not a place to challenge proper gender roles. Girls helped their mothers perform household chores while their brothers sledded, roughed housed and played ball. A typical essay urged young girls to forego sports because they could never throw a ball as well as boys did. Boys read about American Indians, girls about growing up to be like their mothers. One revealing story described a much loved young woman, Betty Gordon, admired not for her talent or brain power, but because she simply forgot that there was such a person as Betty Gordon and with her warm heart and quiet sympathies threw herself into the lives of others. Nothing surpassed the ideal of a selfless female. One minute. Too much screaming at the game last night. By now, it should be apparent that the Sunday School was an institution of significance in the post-war South. But today, I'm also using it as a symbol to demonstrate the importance of home, family, and church as an institution that welcomed and celebrated women's maternal nature and piety to foster in children a path to conversion and salvation. Now, I briefly want to address the issue of Southern women's absence from the women's rights movement. Did devotion to Sunday school, family, and faith co-opt Southern women from engaging in radical activities such as demanding women's rights? Sociologist R. Stephen Warner posits that the more women identify with more organized religion, the less they identify with feminism. Did Southern women's attachment to family and church help to explain their indifference or opposition to women's rights struggles in the North? There is no doubt that most Southern women found their calling in home, community, and church, not at women's rights conventions. Let me provide brief background first. The women's rights movement officially began in 1848 at Seneca Falls, New York, at a two-day convention organized to address women's oppression. <clears throat> the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments written for that meeting outlined women's complaints and demands for change. From then until the Civil War, a group of ardent activists organized annual conventions to press for women's marital property rights, access to a substantial education and to professions, 
expanded causes to win a divorce, and most importantly, the right to vote. After the Civil War, Northern women resumed their efforts with greater passion and a larger following. Admittedly, many reasons help us understand Southern women's disinterest in or opposition to the women's rights movement. First, and perhaps foremost, is that for decades it was Northern. I know I learned when I came here that the Civil War still is going on. So. The regional divide intensified in the years leading up to the Civil War, primarily over the issue of slavery. The antebellum women's rights movement in the North had close ties to abolition, making it truly distasteful to most white Southerners. Abolitionists like Lucretia Mott and Lucy Stone often injected women's rights issues into their anti-slavery lectures. Charlestonians Sarah and Angelina Grimke, who moved to Philadelphia and became Quakers, garnered the disapproval of New England ministers in the late 1830s by speaking to mixed audiences on abolition. The clergy publicly demanded an end to their public lecturing. The power of woman is her dependence, they insisted, for God had ordained her weakness and need of protection. The Grimkes, however, hardly needed protecting. But that protest caused many women to realize that they were as enslaved as the slaves whom abolitionists were trying to free. Like Northern clergymen, Southern whites found bold, assertive women repugnant. While most Americans agreed that women should be dependent on and submissive to men, such ideas had greater importance in the South than in the North. Men believed that the power of woman is her dependence, therefore, they would not have woman excel her proper sphere. Southern women had to know their rightful place in the social hierarchy, for should they challenge it, there was no telling what slaves might do to protest their oppression. In the 1870s, a Southern Methodist, reflecting popular views, heaved a sigh of relief as he recoiled at the chaos being unleashed in the North we shudder when we think what a change would be wrought in society were these notions of women's rights to prevail. May God preserve our sunny South from such a curse, he asserted. The obvious also deserves note. Holding conventions to push for women's rights necessitated towns and cities, in other words, a significant mass of people to become energized at mass gatherings. The South, however, remained largely rural and impoverished after the Civil War. Also, think what all Southerners faced after the Civil War. First and foremost, black and white women had to put their lives in order, ensure their well-being of, the, of their families, and support their men. Home, church, and community were central to their lives, far more important concerns than suffrage. Understandably, white women's desire for a tranquil family life was profound at the war's end. That conflict had cut their world asunder, and many yearned to resume, resume their role as preservers of religion and morality. This was hardly a time to agitate for radical change, but rather to reaffirm the centrality of home, family, and church, and to do everything possible to support men devastated by the war. And with four million slaves now free, white men and white women believed it important that they find common ground rather than divide over controversial issues like women's rights. The South's profound faith and its conservative approach to religion also were factors in Southern women's avoiding a fight for equality. Though the war had emptied churches, it had not destroyed Southern women's faith. Religion provided solace to millions of women who comprised the majority of churchgoers. Attending church, reading the Bible, and praying gave black and white women strength to carry on. Regarded as their family's most pious members, Mothers were expected to raise their children according to scripture and encourage them to embrace religion as a mainstay in their lives. Now, more than ever, the South pinpointed faith as a means to uplift the region and provide hope for a brighter future. Having survived the hardships of war, Southern women needed institutions to inspire, to guide, and to give life meaning. In pondering a brighter future, it made sense to focus attention on the next generation. Certainly, ministers affected Southern women's avoidance of the women's rights movement. Clergymen proved to be the strongest opponents of women's equality before and after the Civil War. As Elizabeth Cady Stanton observed, the greatest enemy of women's rights skulks behind the altar. Some, <laughs> some Northern ministers attended women's rights convention in order to disrupt the proceedings and challenge speakers with irrefutable scriptural proof 
citing female inferiority. Except for Unitarians and Quakers, most ministers denigrated assertive women who demanded their rights and boldly addressed mixed audiences on political and moral issues. Ministers denounced female activists. They quoted scripture, such as, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. To prove that women must be silent, submit to their husbands, and find fulfillment in home and church, not at the lectern or in the halls of Congress. Southern ministers added strident voices to denounce the women's rights movement. Methodist Albert Bledsoe, celebrating the ideal woman to students at Virginia's Wesleyan Female College in 1871, insisted that the home circle was woman's rightful place. He dismissed the women's movement as too insignificant and too absurd to deserve attention, though he then spent several minutes censuring it. How much better that women claim her role as a silent queen of beauty, he intoned, than as a wrangling queen of wit. Northern women who dropped obey from their wedding vows were degrading their sex. Fortunately, blessed and beautiful women of the South were pursuing the proper path in home and church. Thank God they had shown but little taste for such forbidden fruit, he observed. Clergymen who cited scripture to keep women in their place angered Northern suffragists, and not all accepted such admonitions in silence. Lucretia Mott had an uncanny ability to challenge ministers and prove women's equality and strength through her intimate knowledge of biblical passages containing the opposite messages. As she summed up her feelings, the pul pulpit has been prostituted and the Bible ill-used. So incensed was Elizabeth Cady Stanton over ministers' misuse of the Bible that in the 1890s she created a two-volume woman's Bible by removing all passages that depicted women's subordination and by citing passages that celebrated their strength and independence. She decried the fact that women were told that they should feel indebted to the Bible for any advantages they enjoyed. Thus, they reverenced the very book that above all others contains the most degrading ideas of sex, she wrote. The woman's Bible stirred, stirred uneasiness even among suffragists like Susan B. Anthony. One can only imagine the horrified responses it elicited in the South. Though the women's rights movement initially attracted a small percentage of females, numbers increased as more women found cause to question their inferiority and take advantage of new opportunities. After the Civil War, women's colleges nationwide and co-ed universities in the West opened. A few females began to pursue professions formerly close to them, such as law and medicine. In 1869 and 1870, the Wyoming and Utah territories gave women there the right to vote. Northern women held annual conventions sponsored by two vigorous women's rights organizations. One of these associations pub published a popular weekly newspaper for the next half century that was devoted to women's issues. By contrast, the South had no female leadership, no women's rights organizations, no conventions in which to debate issues, and no newspaper to share ideas. Instead, Southern women absorbed messages that they were to be submissive and find contentment through home and church. While men, many Northern men and the media censured suffragists, their sentiments never matched the level of condemnation coming from the South. There, white men ardently opposed the women's right, rights movement, appalled by what they perceived to be mannish, shrieking women. Southern newspapers may have paid little heed to the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention and subsequent meetings, but that indifference abated as the movement strengthened. After the Civil War, Southern senators and congressmen united to oppose any effort to convince the federal government that women deserved the right to vote. They denounced and tabled all petitions demanding a constitutional amendment on women's suffrage. For instance, Senators Joseph Brown of Georgia and George Vest of Missouri were two among many Southern critics of the Susan B. Anthony Amendment brought to Senate committee in 1884. Women should remain on their pedestal and far from the sterner duties of life, Brown insisted. Voting and seeking public office were fatal to the fine and noble female character. If women voted, the family would unravel and the marital relationship collapse. Vest felt relieved that Southern women were different. The madness, the frenzy, the absurdity of this spirit has not touched us here at the South. Woman has not unsexed herself here, but instead only roars as gently as any suckling dove. Facing such ardent opinions and being celebrated for engaging in areas where they could quietly make a difference, most Southern women understandably felt little mo motivation to agitate for their rights. 
Southern white men effectively used flattery to place women on a pedestal. They glorified pious, maternal, submissive women who knew their place and who selflessly served family and church. The absence of Southern black women in the 19th century women's movement also made sense. After 1865, they labored hard and struggled to pull family and home together. Few had time or energy to do much else. Though a handful of northern black women like Sojourner Truth engaged in the women's movement, few white leaders actively sought them out. After the Civil War, as women and black men <clears throat> became the objects of acrimonious, lengthy debates over who should have the right to vote first, the women's suffrage movement took a turn for the worse. Leaders like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and others spewed forth jarring racist rhetoric, denouncing efforts to give black men the vote before educated white women could enjoy that privilege. Southern black women who yearned for equality were not welcomed as participants in the movement. After the Civil War, they often found this a hostile environment. And in fact, later on in the early 20th century in the South, um, some people supported women's suffrage as a way for whites to actually outvote blacks. So where does this leave us? I do not intend to offer a definitive answer, but only to suggest that black and white women's profound devotion to family, community, and church was one reason why they did not involve themselves in the 19th century women's rights movement. As Reverend Bledsoe observed of Southern women, the Christian religion has rightly defined her mission and marked out the sphere of her glory. His was more than wishful thinking. At home, in their communities, and in Sunday schools, Southern mothers shone as they raised their family and their children to become devout Christians. Directly or indirectly, women's loyalty to men and the ministry affected their responses to the politically charged women's movement. For the most part, women absorbed and believed the words that celebrated home and Sunday school as a proper sphere for women. Black women also felt at home there and realized that family, church, and community came first. They wisely turned inward, away from racism, violence, and harm's way, and influence situations where they could make a difference. As one Southern man insisted, women should keep within the high and holy sphere for which nature and God, and God of nature intended her. The glory of the nation and the glory of the South depends on the ministry of woman. Southern women's strong faith and family were mainstays in their lives. Men, the clergy, tradition, and scripture celebrated accommodating, pious, submissive women who devoted themselves to Sunday school, not suffrage. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Would you please raise your hands? Thanks. Can you tell us a little about your sources? Um, well, for both books or just the Sunday School book? Sunday School book. Um, I visited uh, Methodist archives, Baptist archives, Presbyterian archives, um, both in Nashville. I mean, in Nashville, um, I um, went up to uh, Philadelphia to do the Presbyterian archives. I also went to a lot of university libraries that had been founded by, I primarily did Baptist Methodists and Presbyterians, which covered a lot of the South. I uh, went to various schools that had archives for those uh, individual denominations. Uh, I read Sunday school newspapers because the press became a huge part of the Sunday school movement with these publishing houses, and they published enormous amounts of material. I was absolutely overwhelmed with, with sources. They are enormous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The uh, points you pointed out still seem to exist. I noticed in the election that in New Hampshire they talked about one in ten attended church regularly on Sunday, and then when the campaign would move to South Carolina, five in ten attended church regularly. So that distinction between North and South still stands out. And it's often been women who have countered ERA and stuff like that the most. As a man, what do y'all really want? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, um, in, this, in this new book on Seneca Falls, I deal with that very issue that um, some of the most ardent opponents of uh, suffrage were women. They began to organize by the late 19th century. 
But the other thing I want to point out in my book is that I also, there were also a number of men who were involved in the women's rights movement. Again, they were all northern. But um, are you just saying we, we are still not, we still don't have it right? I mean, it's huge. I, I mean, it's a, it's a huge question. Um, all we can hope is that things are moving in the right direction, but in some denominations, it's very slow. Um, really, the first ordained minister um, you know, was not ordained until, the, um, what, 1851, I think it was, and she was condemned, roundly condemned, for um, serving as a minister in a little church in upstate New York. It's a huge issue. Quakers have always been open to women, though, um, in terms of serving as ministers. Questions? Let's see. We got one in the back. Were you implying that women uh, in the South were, pl were paid to teach Sunday school? You said staff. Uh, they were not paid to teach Sunday school. It was totally volunteer. Okay. Yeah. And they, this was a, a highly desirable volunteer activity. In fact, it's a, when we look at all the volunteer activities that women were involved in, Sunday school teaching was the number one uh, sort of benevolent uh, you know, activity for women. It was huge. Okay, from over this side of the room. So I have one. Okay. Apart from the Quakers and the Unitarians, what denominational differences did you find in these early attitudes against the women's rights and so on? In other words, were there major differences among, say, the Protestants? Did the Catholics take a stand? Um, that's a really good question, and actually I, I didn't go into that. I mean, these are sort of two separate books, and I only kind of brought them together for this particular talk. Um, so I, I'm not sure I could really, you know, properly say the Baptists were more conservative than the Methodists. Um, it was pretty universal condemnation, at least in the South. Yeah. Questions? Right here. Tyler. Hold on, get your mic. Uh, ancestors of mine and older generations of, and also friends of older generations have indicated that today we don't really know what church is. Back then, church lasted all day. And some places around here it still does. But uh, <laughs> my question is, was the Sunday school a longer time than just the hour that set aside now, or was it a basically all day thing for Sunday, Sunday uh, school? In the, in the three Protestant denominations I studied, among whites, Sunday school pretty much stuck to an hour. And there was lots of debate about whether it should precede church or it should come after church. Um, that was a huge debate. In black Sunday schools, the Sunday school often lasted two or three hours. Um, it was just considered, as you're talking about, part of this whole day that was dedicated to church. Whites seemed more into um, having a time frame. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to mention that I think is really interesting about black Sunday schools is that this is where many African-American children and adults learned to read and write. There was just no way for um, the public school system, which was only beginning after the Civil War, you know, and the South didn't have much money, didn't have much money to start schools, and it certainly wasn't, most, most Southern states were not going to spend a lot of money uh, on, on black education. And so what happened is that a lot of children Black children learn to read and write in the Sunday school. So it became more than just a place to, um, you know, memorize um, scripture and, and, you know, read the Bible. It, it was a, a total, almost a total institution. Yes, we have a question right here. Hello, Professor. How are you doing? Fine. Um, in your research, did you find anything on Jane Addams? And if you did, what role did she have in this movement? And uh, also uh, Ida B. Wells? Um, no, to tell you, um, Jane Addams is later than my time period, so um, I didn't, um, and Ida B. Wells was not really involved in the Sunday School movement and not involved in the women's rights movement. You know, she had, she had her issues about lynching, and um, that was plenty, I think. But I mean, I would say just, as, just the way, I mean, in a way, the way she lived her life must have been incredibly inspiring. Um, she was so bold and brave and, you know, just her life was threatened at times and um, she's an incredible woman. But she doesn't really fit in with this, this particular um, 
either the Sunday School Movement or with my women's rights movement, because which, that ends about 1890. Yeah, but great women, absolutely great. Judge Fleming. Hi, I'm Vic Fleming. Davidson class of 73. <gasps> All right. Two questions. Yes. First, All right. first well, we one did, we is, knew so that, you saw we the knew that was coming. You saw the we game. knew that was coming. <laughs> the first question is, how about that Stephen Curry? Did you see that last shot last I night? Did. I did. I was going to ask you All right, about that all right, shot. all right, all right. What's your question, uh, Judge? I mean, almost from half court, right? Just, uh, yeah, my, okay. My question, my question is this, um, and I was forced to go to Sunday school from the time I can remember, and to memorize uh, everything uh, you can possibly think of, and this was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, my sense is that it, since that time, memorization in Sunday school has gone down, and that's what I've heard as I've been exposed to it. I wondered if your research showed anything about the intensity of memorization, whether it had any real effect, uh, the people who did memorize, but, well, uh, and, and whether it has been de-emphasized uh, over the years as people seem yeah, to Yeah, I don't has. remember my children memorizing anything in Sunday school. I had to memorize things in Sunday school. As, um, but yes, it was a huge part of the Sunday school movement. Now, how that translated into children's ultimate learning or whether they were smarter for the memorization, you know, there are no, no studies on that. But yes, they, uh, they would have these competitions, and that's how, how they, they encouraged children to memorize, is that if you learned so many Bible verses, you know, you would get gold stars, and then eventually you'd get a little locket or a book or a Bible or something like that. So they began to use sort of competition as well as rewards to get children to do an enormous amount of memorizing. And I mean, these children would learn hundreds and hundreds of Bible verses in, in these competitions. It was truly amazing. So they were getting a lot of that. And that's got to be great training, great training. Well, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, my book went up to 1915, and up to that point, these, uh, <laughs> these competitions and memorizing were very much a part of the Sunday school classroom experience, very much so. Representative Smith has a question right here. Uh, when Phyllis Shafley came to Arkansas last year to fight against the ratification of uh, the Equal Rights Amendment in Arkansas to be the 36th state to ratify that, she used the arguments, one, like you talked about, which is proxemics, women belong in this sphere, and if they get out of it, uh, then they are beyond their scope, and they need to move back into where they belong. And the other one was fear tactics, like men and women using bathrooms together. Uh, what, what did you find in terms of fear tactics? Um, or was it prevalent then like it is now? Well, the, the fears that were, that were um, expressed in this time period were you know, the, 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 the dissolution of marriage the fact that women would be come outspoken and they would counter their husbands. So basically family dissolution was the, was the big issue. Um, and that also any type of political involvement for women in terms of voting, expressing opinions in public, uh, would exhaust them, would wear them out. Um, that they weren't strong enough to be able to engage in politics. Another argument was that politics was grubby. Uh, you know, where voting poll booths were often in stables or in bar rooms or whatever, and women should not sell it, you know, sully their natures by going into these loc locales. Um, the other thing, though, I wanted to mention, there were the Philly Schlafly's of the 19th century. Uh, for instance, a woman named Catherine Beecher was one of the major opponents of women's suffrage for the very thing that you're talking about in terms of all of these arguments. And yet she went around and lectured, and she wrote books and made an enormous amount of money Phyllis Schlafly was a lawyer. She went around lecturing, telling women they needed to stay at home. I love it. <laughs> no, I, yeah, very contradictory. Yeah, questions? They, they had them then. Any other questions? <laughs> Dennis, what's up? Yeah, did you find that uh, many of the Sunday schools were uh, incubators for churches to get them started? Ab absolutely. I mean, that's a very good, very good question. In fact, because it was so easy and inexpensive to start a Sunday school, the denominations often would move to an area and start a Sunday school first and get that going and then realize that the community or the, the people in this rural area were committed to have their children attend Sunday school. Then they could commit to thinking about building a church, bringing in a minister, etc. So. Absolutely, that Sunday school in many cases in both black and white denominations was indeed an incubator for churches. 
Yeah, absolutely. Let's, uh, let's give Sally Major. McMillan a great round of applause. Thank you.